Good morning. In unison, good morning. In unison, good morning, your honor. Good morning. There's two things we're going to do before we commence with the opening statement. One of them is that I'm going to read the indictment. Remember, during jury selection, I generally told you what the indictment contained, and it does contain that. But I want to read it specifically to you because it's a little more detailed than the general description. The second thing I'm going to do is to give you some pre-trial jury instruction. And they're very brief, but they're meant to help you as you start to hear the evidence, and as you hear the opening statements of counsel. What I'm going to do is, again, come down to where you are to talk to you. I just, this distance between us is disturbing to me. This is the indictment. The people of the state of California versus Michael Joe Jackson, defendant. Count 1. The grand jury of the county of Santa Barbara, state of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 182, subdivision, a, sub, 1, conspiracy, in that on or about and between February 1, 2003, and March 31, 2003, in the county of Santa Barbara, state of California, he did conspire with Ronald Conitzer, Dieter Weisner, and Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, Vinny Amen, Frederick Mark Schaffel, and other uncharged co-conspirators and co-conspirators whose identities are unknown, to commit the crime of a violation of Penal Code Section 278, child abduction, a felony, a violation of Penal Code Section 236, false imprisonment, a felony, a violation of Penal Code Section 518, extortion, a felony, and that pursuant to and for the purpose of carrying out the objectives and purposes of the aforesaid conspiracy, to wit, unlawfully controlling, withholding, isolating, concealing, enticing and threatening John Doe, James Doe, Judy Doe, all minor children, and Jane Doe, an adult, did commit one or more of the following overt acts in the state of California, at least one of them in the county of Santa Barbara. Over Act No. 1. On or about February 4, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson told Jane Doe that the lives of her children, John, James and Judy Doe, were in danger due to the recent broadcast on British television of the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, in which John Doe appears with Michael Joe Jackson. And Michael, excuse me, appears with Michael Joe Jackson, period. Michael Joe Jackson did tell Jane Doe that she and her three children would be flown to Miami to participate in a press conference, which press conference never took place. Overt Act No. 2. On and between February 4, 2003, and February 5, 2003, the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, in which John Doe appears, was broadcast in the United States. Michael Joe Jackson did personally prevent the Doe family from viewing the program while at the Turnberry Resort Hotel in Miami, Florida. Overt Act No. 3. On and between February 7, 2003, and February 8, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson did return the Doe family to Santa Barbara in a private jet. On the flight, Michael Joe Jackson did sit with John Doe and did give him an alcoholic beverage, concealed in a soft drink can. Michael Joe Jackson did then present John Doe with a wristwatch. Michael Joe Jackson did tell John Doe that the watch was worth $75,000. Michael Joe Jackson did tell John Doe not to tell anyone about them drinking alcoholic beverages together. Overt Act No. 4. On or about February 8, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson brought the Doe family to Jackson's Neverland Ranch, where John, James, Judy and Jane Doe remained for approximately five days. Overt Act No. 5. On and between February 6, 2003, and February 12, 2003, in both Miami, Florida, and at Neverland Ranch in Santa Barbara County, Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Weisner did tell Jane Doe that there were death threats made against her and her children by unknown individuals. They did further tell Jane Doe that the only way to assure the safety of her family was for the does to participate in the making of a rebuttal video favorable to Michael Joe Jackson. Overt Act No. 6. On and between February 12, 2003, and February 15, 2003, 
After the Doe family had departed Neverland Ranch in the night, Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, did telephone Jane Doe and did urge her to return with her children to Neverland Ranch and did say, quote, I know Michael would love for you to come back to the ranch, for the safety of all concerned, unquote. And, quote, now is not the time to be out there alone, unquote. And, quote, never turn your back on Michael, unquote. And, Michael wants to see you and the family, that's in quotes. And, quote, you need to go back up to the ranch and see Michael, because he's very concerned, unquote. And, quote, even staying another night alone is not safe, unquote. Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, did tell Jane Doe that, we would love for you to go on tape and just say something beautiful about Michael. Frank Cassio did assure Jane Doe and John Doe that Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Wisner would no longer be present at the ranch if they returned. He did state, they are not there. I know that for a fact. Overt Act Number 7. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, did threaten James Doe that Cassio did have ways to make James Doe's parents disappear. Frank Cassio did tell John Doe, I could have your mother killed. Overt Act Number 8. On or about February 14, 2003, and February 15, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson's personal chauffeur, Gary Hearn, did drive to Jane Doe's Los Angeles residence and did transport her and her children back to the Neverland Ranch in Santa Barbara County. Overt Act No. 9. On and between February 14, 2003, and February 15, 2003, upon the Doe family's return to Neverland Ranch, Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Wisner were, in fact, present, whereupon Jane Doe asked to leave with her children. Ronald Conitzer and Dieter Wisner did tell Jane Doe that she was free to depart, however her children must remain at the ranch. Overt Act No. 10. During the month of February 2003, in Santa Barbara County, California, Michael Joe Jackson's personal security staff was directed in writing not to allow John Doe to leave Neverland Ranch. Over Act No. 11. During the month of February 2003, Frederick Mark Schaffel, Christian Robinson and an unknown attorney did prepare a script of questions to be asked of the Doe family during the filming of the rebuttal video by Hamid Maslahi. Michael Joe Jackson's personal videographer. Overt Act No. 12. On or about February 19, 2003, the Doe children were transported by Hamid Maslahi from Neverland Ranch to Maslahi's home in the San Fernando Valley, and on the same date, Vinny Amen did transport Jane Doe to Hamid Maslahi's filming of the rebuttal video. Overt Act No. 13. On or about February 19, 2003, in Los Angeles County between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., the employees and associates of Michael Joe Jackson did tape the rebuttal video, an interview of the Doe family, in the presence of Vinnie A. Men and Bradley Miller, a licensed private investigator. During the taping, previously scripted questions were asked of the Doe family. Overt Act No. 14. On or about February 20, 2003, Vinnie A. Men did transport Jane Doe to Norwalk, in Los Angeles County, to obtain birth certificates of the Doe family for the purpose of obtaining passports and visas to travel to Brazil. Overt Act No. 15. On and between February 25, 2003, and March 2, 2003, Vinnie Amen did take the Doe family from Neverland Ranch to the Country Inn and Suites in Calabasas, Los Angeles County. Vinnie Amen did transport Jane Doe to public offices in Los Angeles County where passports showing the destinations of Italy and France and visas for entrance to Brazil for the Doe family were obtained. Frederick Mark Schaffel, business partner of Michael Joe Jackson and president of Neverland Valley Entertainment, did pay expenses in connection with this activity. Overt Act No. 16. On or about February 25, 2003. Frederick Mark Schaffel did make airline reservations for the Doe family to travel to Brazil on March 3, 2003. Overt Act No. 17. On or about February 26, 2003, Frederick Mark Schaffel and Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, excuse me. On or about February 26, 2003, 
Frederick Mark Schaffel paid Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, $1,000 in connection with, vacation, expenses of the Doe family. Overt Act No. 18. On or about February 23, sick, 2003, Frederick Mark Schaffel did pay Vinnie Amen the sum of $500 cash for costs related to the Brazilian visas of the Doe family. Overt Act No. 19. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at the Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did have John Doe sleep in his bedroom and in his bed. Overt Act No. 20. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did house Jane and Judy Doe in a guest cottage on Neverland Ranch where Jane and Judy Doe slept. Overt Act No. 21. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did show sexually explicit materials to John and James Doe. Overt Act No. 22. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, at Neverland Ranch, Michael Joe Jackson did drink alcoholic beverages in the presence of John and James Doe and provided alcoholic beverages to them. Overt Act No. 23. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, Michael Joe Jackson did monitor and maintain control over the activities at Neverland Ranch by means of multiple interior door locks, proximity sensor alarm devices, and a keypad combination lock, as well as video and telephone surveillance equipment. Michael Joe Jackson did personally monitor telephone conversations of Jane Doe, without her knowledge or permission. Overt Act No. 24. On or about March 1, 2003, Vinnie Amen did pay the rent on the residence of the Doe family in Los Angeles County and moved their belongings into storage. Overt Act No. 25. On or about March 6, 2003, Vinnie Amen did go to John Burroughs Middle School in Los Angeles County and he did withdraw John and James Doe from their enrollment there, telling school authorities that the children were relocating to Phoenix, Arizona. Overt Act No. 26. On or about March 9, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson was told by John Doe that John Doe had a medical appointment the following day, at which time he was to give his medical staff a 24-hour-long urine collection specimen for laboratory analysis. Michael Joe Jackson, in Santa Barbara County, did tell John Doe to cancel the appointment, because the sample would reveal that John Doe had been consuming alcoholic beverages while staying at the Neverland Ranch. On or about March 10, 2003, in Los Angeles County, after Jane Doe refused to cancel the medical appointment and while on the way to the medical appointment, Vinnie Amen did destroy most of John Doe's collected urine specimen, intended for laboratory analysis in connection with John Doe's follow-up treatment for the disease of cancer. Overt Act No. 27. On and between February 2003 and March 2003, in Los Angeles County, and as revealed by a surveillance tape located on November 18, 2003, in the office of private investigator Bradley Miller, an unknown co-conspirator conducted video surveillance of John Doe and various members of John Doe's family, including his grandmother and grandfather, his mother, his mother's boyfriend, his brother and his sister, at and near their respective residences and elsewhere. Overt Act No. 28. On or about March 31, 2003, Michael Joe Jackson did direct Frederick Mark Schaffel to pay Frank Cassio, a.k.a. Frank Tyson, the sum of $1 million, from, Petty Cash, of Neverland Valley Entertainment on behalf of Michael Joe Jackson. Those are the end of the overt acts. We're now going to count two. Count two. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, a lewd act upon a child, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, he did willfully, unlawfully, and lewdly commit a lewd and lascivious act upon and with the body and certain parts and members thereof of John Doe, a child under the age of 14, under the age of 14 years, with the intent of arousing, appealing to, and gratifying the lust, 
passions, and sexual desires of said defendant and the said child. The further allegation that in the circumstances of the crime alleged in this count the crime constituted substantial sexual conduct with a child under the age of 14 years, within the meaning of Penal Code Section 1203.066, Subdivision, A, 8. Count 3. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit. A violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, a lewd act upon a child, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, he did willfully, unlawfully and lewdly commit a lewd and lascivious act upon and with the body and certain parts and members thereof of John Doe, a child under the age of 14 years, with the intent of arousing, appealing to, and gratifying the lust, passions and sexual desires of said defendant and said child. The further allegation that in the circumstances of the crime alleged in this count the crime constituted substantial sexual conduct with a child under the age of 14 years, within the meaning of Penal Code Section 1203.066, Subdivision, A, 8. Count 4. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 288, subdivision, a, lewd act upon a child, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, he did willfully, unlawfully and lewdly commit a lewd and lascivious act upon and with the body and certain parts and members thereof of John Doe a child under the age of 14 years, with the intent of arousing, appealing to, and gratifying the lusts, passions, and sexual desires of said defendant and the said child. The further allegation that in the circumstances of this count, the crime constituted substantial sexual conduct with a child under the age of 14 years, within the meaning of Penal Code Section 1203.066, a, 8. Count 5. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, a, lewd act upon a child, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California. He did willfully and unlawfully and lewdly commit a lewd and lascivious act upon and with the body and certain parts and members thereof of John Doe, a child under the age of 14 years, with the intent of arousing, appealing to, and gratifying the lusts, passions, and sexual desires of said defendant and said child. The further allegation that in the circumstances of the crime alleged in this count the crime constituted substantial sexual conduct with a child under the age of 14 years within the meaning of Penal Code Section 1203.066, Subdivision, A, 8. Count 6. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Sections 664 and 288, Subdivision, A, attempt to commit a lewd act upon a child, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, he did willfully, unlawfully and lewdly attempt to have John Doe, a child under 14 years of age, commit a lewd and lascivious act upon and with defendant Michael Joe Jackson's body and certain parts and members thereof, with the intent of arousing, appealing to, and gratifying the lust, passions, and sexual desires of the said defendant and the said child. Count 7. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 222, administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, 
he did unlawfully administer to John Doe an intoxicating agent, to wit, alcohol, with the intent thereby to enable and assist him to commit a felony, to wit, child molestation, in violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, A. Count 8. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 222, administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, he did unlawfully administer to John Doe an intoxicating agent, to wit, alcohol, and with the intent thereby to enable and assist himself to commit a felony, to wit, child molestation, in violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, A. Count 9. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a felony, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 222, administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, in that on or about and between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, he did unlawfully administer to John Doe an intoxicating agent, to wit, alcohol, with the intent thereby to enable and assist him to commit a felony, to wit, child molestation, in violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, A. Count 10. The Grand Jury of the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, by this indictment, hereby accuses Michael Joe Jackson of a crime, to wit, a violation of Penal Code Section 222, administering an intoxicating agent to assist in the commission of a felony, in that on or about between February 20, 2003, and March 12, 2003, in the County of Santa Barbara, State of California, he did unlawfully administer to John Doe an intoxicating agent, to wit, alcohol, with the intent thereby to enable and assist him to commit a felony, to wit, child molestation, in violation of Penal Code Section 288, Subdivision, A. It is further alleged that counts 2 through 5 are serious felonies within the meaning of Penal Code Section 1192.7, Subdivision, C, 6. As to counts 2 through 5, it is further alleged, pursuant to Penal Code Section 1203.066, Subdivision, A, 8, that the victim in the above offense, John Doe, was under the age of 14 years and Michael Joe Jackson had substantial sexual conduct with John Doe. Pursuant to the provisions of Penal Code Section 293.5 the use of John Doe, as it appears in the indictment is for the purpose of protecting the privacy of the alleged victim. This indictment is signed by Ronald Zonin on behalf of Tom Snedden, signed by Gordon Ockenclos on behalf of Thomas Snedden, and is declared to be a true bill by the foreperson of the grand jury, who signed it on April 21, 2004. Up until this time the indictment in this case has been sealed. It is hereby unsealed. I'm now going to read to you a short two- or three-page statement of some jury instructions that I hope will help you as you begin to listen to the case. But I need some water. And I want to remind you, after reading that entire indictment, that Mr. Jackson has pled not guilty to all those charges. He's put every allegation in those charges at issue by pleading not guilty. And the indictment is not evidence of his guilt. Members and alternate members of the jury, you have been selected and sworn as jurors and alternate jurors. I shall now instruct you as to your basic functions, duties and conduct. At the conclusion of the case, I will give you further instructions on the law. All of the court's instructions, whether given before, during or after the taking of testimony, are of equal importance. You must base the decisions you make on the facts and the law. First, you must determine the facts from the evidence received in the trial and not from any other source. A fact is something proved by the evidence or by a stipulation. A stipulation is an agreement between attorneys regarding the facts. Second, you must apply the law that I state to you to the facts as you determine them. 
and in this way arrive at your verdict and any finding you are instructed to include in your verdict. You must accept and follow the law as I state it to you, regardless of whether you agree with it or not. If anything concerning the law said by the attorneys in their arguments or at any other time during the trial conflicts with my instructions on the law, you must follow my instructions. You must not be influenced by pity for the defendant, or by prejudice against him. You must not be biased against the defendant because he has been arrested for this offense, charged with a crime, or brought to trial. None of these circumstances is evidence of guilt. And you must not infer or assume any or all of them. Assume from any or all of them that he is more likely to be guilty than not guilty. You must not be influenced by mere sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. Both the people and the defendant have a right to expect that you will conscientiously consider and weigh the evidence, apply the law, and reach a just verdict, regardless of the consequences. Statements made by the attorneys during the trial are not evidence. However, if the attorneys stipulate or agree to a fact, you must regard that fact as proven. If an objection is sustained to a question, do not guess what the answer might have been. Do not speculate as to the reason for the objection. Do not assume to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked a witness. A question is not evidence and may be considered only as it helps you to understand the answer. Do not consider for any purpose any offer of evidence that is rejected or any evidence that is stricken by the court. Treat it as though you had never heard it. You must not independently investigate the facts or the law or consider or discuss facts as to which there is no evidence. This means, for example, that you must not, on your own, visit the scene, conduct experiments, or consult reference works or persons for additional information. You must not converse among yourselves or with anyone else, including, but not limited to, spouses, spiritual leaders or advisors or therapists on any subject connected with the trial except when all of the following conditions exist. a. The case has been submitted to you for your decision by the court following arguments by counsel and jury instructions. b. You are discussing the case with a fellow juror. and c. All twelve jurors and no other persons are present in the jury deliberating room. You must not read or listen to any accounts or discussions of the case reported by the newspapers or other news media, including radio, television, the internet, or any other source. You will be given notebooks and pencils. Leave them on your seat when you leave each day and at each recess. You will be able to take them into the jury room when you deliberate. A word of caution. You may take notes. However, you should not permit note-taking to distract you from the ongoing proceedings. Remember, you are the judges of the believability of the witnesses. Notes are only an aid to memory and should not take precedence over recollection. A juror who does not take notes should rely on his or her recollection of the evidence and not be influenced by the fact that other jurors do take notes. Notes are for the note-taker's own personal use in refreshing his or her recollection of the evidence. Should a discrepancy exist between a juror's recollection of the evidence and a juror's notes, or between a juror's recollection and that of another, you have a right to and may request, the court reporter read back the relevant testimony, which must prevail. You will be permitted to separate at the evening recess. You must return following, on the following days at such times as I instruct you. During recess, you must not discuss with anyone, any subject connected with this trial. As for the alternate jurors, you are bound by all these admonitions. You must not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with the trial or form or express any opinion on it until the case is submitted to you, which means until such time as you are substituted in for one of the twelve jurors and begin deliberating on the case. This means that you must not decide how you would vote if you were deliberating with the other jurors, and that you must not form or express an opinion about the case unless and until you have been substituted in as a juror in the case. You are not to visit or view the premises or place where the crime or crimes charged were allegedly committed or any other premises or place mentioned or involved in the case. During the course of this trial, and before you begin your deliberations, you must keep an open mind on this case, and upon all of the issues that you will be asked to decide. In other words, 
you must not form or express any opinions on this case until the matter is finally submitted to you. Before and within 90 days of your discharge as a juror in this matter, you must not request, accept, agree to accept, or discuss with any person receiving or accepting any payment or benefit in consideration for supplying any information concerning the trial. You must promptly report to the court any incident within your knowledge involving an attempt by any person either to improperly influence any member of this jury or to tell a juror his or her view of the evidence of the case. At this time, the lawyers will be permitted to make an opening statement, if they choose to do so. An opening statement is not evidence. Because it is not evidence, do not take any notes during the opening statement. Neither is it argument. Counsel are not permitted to argue the case at this point in the proceedings. An opening statement is simply an outline by counsel of what he or she believes or expects the evidence will show in this trial. Its sole purpose is to assist you in understanding the case as it is presented to you. Mr. Sneddon. Yes, Your Honor. I understand there is a change in the way we're going to refer to the alleged victims in this case. That's correct, Your Honor. And the change is that we are going to use the real names. All right. Counsel agree. Defense would agree to that, Your Honor. And I understand the reason for this change in this case is that there is so much documentary, written evidence that has their names and it would be pretty much impossible to proceed without reaching this agreement. That's correct, Your Honor. I discussed it with the family and explained to them the technical problems of trying to go through all the redaction process with every tape and video and everything else, and they understood. And they said that they were comfortable with it, the decision to change it back. All right. I'll accept that agreement and request. And I will allow the names of the victims to be used in this case. In doing so, I want to express to the members of the press who did not reveal the names of the victims in accordance with our law, how deeply appreciated that was by the court. And I want you to know that in other cases, it would remain very important to continue your policies that you expressed not revealing the victims' names in these type of cases. Are you ready to proceed? Judge, there's one final thing that we discussed a long time ago, but I wanted to double check with the court. There is a motion to exclude witnesses, is that correct? I don't remember. Yes, there was, during one of the hearings, a motion. Is there a motion to exclude witnesses during the trial? Yes, sir. I believe that was the request of both parties. We would make a similar motion, Your Honor. All right. The motion to exclude witnesses made by both parties is granted. Yes, sir. Does that require witnesses not to be present during your opening remarks or just during the testimony? Well, I understand. I'm sorry, Your Honor. My understanding would sort of defeat the proposition if they were allowed to remain in the courtroom during the opening statement, by either party. All right, then. Other than the investigating officer, of course, who's been designated. All right. Any witnesses that have been subpoenaed to testify in this case or who expect to testify, if you're in the courtroom at this time, you're required to leave the courtroom. Seeing nobody leaving, you may proceed. I am going to take breaks at the standard time. So, just so you know. Good morning. In unison, good morning. On February the 3rd of 2003, Michael Jackson, the defendant in this case, world was rocked. And it didn't rock in a musical sense. It rocked in a real-life sense. And it was rocked by the fallout from the broadcast in the United Kingdom of the Martin Bashir video documentary, Living with Michael Jackson. And his life was rocked so badly that one of his longtime closest and most trusted associates, and co-conspirator in this case, Mark Schaffel described it as, a train wreck. Now, I'm sure that some of you ladies and gentlemen are going to be a little surprised to learn, as the testimony and the evidence unfolds in this case, that actually for years prior to the Bashir video that the defendant in this case was heavily in debt. That his musical assets. Objection. And his real estate property. Objection. Sustained. Your Honor, that's the motive for the. Objection. Again, Your Honor. The. He's violating your order. The final determination as to the financial evidence coming in has not been reached. Very well, Your Honor. Unfortunately, for Mr. Jackson, 
the effect of the Bashir documentary had just the opposite effect. This case, in count one, is a case about conspiracy. It's about the train wreck situation caused by the Bashir documentary. It's about the world's reaction and how it created the motive for the once superstar's desperate attempt to salvage his once very powerful musical career. This is also a case about Michael Jackson's exploitation of a 13-year-old boy and cancer survivor, Gavin Arvizo. It's about how Jackson, after almost a year of having no contact with this young boy, reached out to the young boy and invited him to Neverland Ranch to participate in the Bashir documentary. It's about how he never told this boy that the interview was anything other than an audition. That the boy nor any member of their family realized that the interview that occurred on the ranch that day was going to be broadcast internationally around the world and seen by millions and millions of people. This case is about the defendant. It's about his manipulation of the young boy's adolescence through exposing him to strange sexual behavior and introducing him to sexually graphic adult magazines. It's about how he traded on the boy's obvious and often expressed admiration for the defendant. And it's about how he exploited the knowledge of the fact that the child had no father in his life, and had had no father in his life for over a year, because of the separation and divorce of the parents, and the fact that there was a court restraining order prohibiting the father from seeing the children. He exploited this paternal relationship and created another relationship with the child as a surrogate father, encouraging both the child, Gavin Arvizo, the mother, and other members of the family to refer to him as, Daddy, or, Michael Daddy. You will soon see, as one of the first witnesses in this case, the Martin Bashir documentary. You will see Bashir's probing and incredulous questioning of the defendant. And you will see the defendant's almost casual responses to his questions in trying to justify his admitted practice and long-standing custom and habit of sharing his bedroom, and his bed, with young boys. You will soon hear the testimony from such witnesses as Anne Gabriel, Rudy Provencio, Ian Drew, and others close to the defendant in this case, that the Bashir documentary was deemed a disaster. And that the Arvizo family was a dangerous loose end. One that needed to be isolated. One that needed to be controlled. And one that needed to be convinced to participate in a pro-Michael Jackson video that was planned to be aired later in mid-February. As the trial unfolds, you will also learn that maintaining that isolation and maintaining that control became very problematic. And gaining the cooperation of the mother, Janet Arvizo, was very, very difficult. And you will learn the reasons why. The evidence through the Arvizo family, and corroborated by tape recordings and other witnesses, will show that when logic and reason appeals to trust, deceit, and lies and threats, failed. That the defendant in this case and his co-conspirators were able to obtain the valuable interview that they needed from the Arvizo family through extortion. And it was done very simply. As events turned out, and I will explain to you in later detail during other parts of my opening statement here this morning. That as a result of the things that occurred in this case, authorities from the school contacted the Department of Social Services in Los Angeles, and they contacted Mrs. Arvizo, and they wanted Mrs. Arvizo to produce the children for an interview on February the 20th in Los Angeles. But Mrs. Arvizo had a problem. Because Mrs. Arvizo at that point in time was not on the ranch, and the children were and she had refused to participate in the video that they desired on a number of occasions prior to this. She placed a phone call to one of the co-conspirators in this case, Frank Tyson, who also goes by the name of Frank Cassio. And it was put to her quite simply, no children, no video. No children, no video. She had no choice but to agree for herself and the children to participate in the video. What followed was kind of a bizarre event in the sense that the children were taken from Neverland Ranch by Michael Jackson's personal videographer. Hit the switch. Well, I know I've had some effects on people before, but I don't think I've ever had that one. Laughter. Okay, back on. Wait just one second. I don't need it. You don't need it. I told you, I don't need it. I guess that gives new meaning to an electric personality. I think we were at that point in time now where we're talking about the fact that the children are at the ranch. And the defendant's personal videographer, Hamid Maslahi, is commissioned to bring the children from the ranch to his Calabasas residence where the filming is going to take place. Another member of the co-conspirators team named Vinnie Amen, who also goes by the name of Vinnie Black, picks up Janet Arvizo at a West Los Angeles apartment where she's staying with her future husband and fiancé, Major Jay Jackson. They meet at Maslay's residence in Calabasas. And it's now approaching about 11.30 or almost midnight when everybody arrives. 
What results is a video that occurs, and I'm going to speak more about later in my presentation, but occurs and doesn't end until 2 o'clock in the morning. And the children are then taken back to West Los Angeles for a 9 o'clock appointment with the Department of Social Services people, the very next morning. Now, what I want to do is, at this point, is I want to share with you just a few of the comments from the Bashir transcript. I want to share with you some of the things that caused the reactions and the movement of the people and the parties involved in this particular case that I've already discussed rather briefly. And before I do that, though, I want to stop and tell you, in caution and in candor and in fairness, this video that you will hear is about an hour and 40 minutes long. And it's not my intention to lift from that, from that video just a portion of it. But you will see from what I'm going to lift, that it is the parts that deal most specifically with this case. This is the interview of Martin Bashir and the defendant. It's the interview that occurs towards the end of the eight-month journey in the filming of The Life and Living with Michael Jackson video documentary. Martin Bashir. It was a great privilege to meet Gavin because he's had a lot of suffering in his life. Michael Jackson. Yeah. Martin Bashir. When Gavin was there, he talked about the fact that he shares your bedroom. Michael Jackson. Yes. Martin Bashir. Can you understand why people would worry about that? Michael Jackson. Because they're ignorant. Bashir. But is it really appropriate for a 40-year-old man to share a bedroom with a child that is not related to him? Michael Jackson. That's a beautiful thing. Martin Bashir. That's not a worrying thing. Michael Jackson. Why should it be worrying? Who's the criminal? Who's the Jack the Ripper in the room? This is a guy trying to help and heal a child. I'm sleeping in a sleeping bag on the floor. I give him the bed because he has a brother named Star, so him and Star took the bed and I'm on the floor in the sleeping bag. Did you ever sleep in bed with him? No, but I have slept in bed with many children. I sleep in bed with all of them. Bashir. But is that right, Michael? Michael. It's very right. It's very loving. That's what the world needs now. More love, more love. Martin Bashir. The world. The world needs. Michael Jackson. More heart. Martin Bashir. The world. The world needs a man, 44, sleeping in bed with children. Michael Jackson. No, you're making it. No, no, you're making it all wrong. That's wrong. Bashir. Well, tell me. Help me. Michael Jackson. Because what's wrong with sharing a love? You don't sleep with your kids and some other kids, I'm sorry. You don't sleep with your kids or some other kids who need love who didn't have a good childhood. Martin Bashir. No, no, I don't. I never dream of sleeping, Michael Jackson. Well, I would. I would. Because you've never been where I've been mentally. Later on in the transcript, Bashir goes on. But isn't that precisely the problem? That when you actually invite children into your bed, you never know what's going to happen. Michael Jackson. But when you say, bed, you're thinking sexual. They make it sexual. It's not sexual. We're going to sleep. I tuck them in. We put. I put a little, like, music on. We do a little story time. I read a book. It's very sweet. We put the fireplace on. We give them hot milk, you know, and we have little cookies. It's very charming. It's very sweet. Ladies and gentlemen, this case begins with 10-year-old Gavin Arvizo. It begins in the year 2000. It begins when Gavin Arvizo is living with his mother, Janet Arvizo, and his father David, and his older sister Davalin, and his younger brother Star, in a studio apartment in East Los Angeles. It begins with his diagnosis of stage 4 cancer at the age of 10. In an attempt to stem the cancer, a medicine-sized, medicine ball-sized tumor, weighing 16 pounds, is removed from his abdomen. Lesions were removed from his lungs. His gall bladder was removed. Lymph nodes were removed. And one kidney was also removed. For a year, he underwent chemotherapy. Long recuperative hospitalizations and long periods of recuperation at his grandparents' place. And in all candor, the doctors told the Arvizos and told Gavin Arvizo to prepare for his funeral, that he wasn't going to survive. But, you see, Gavin's a fighter, and Gavin wasn't willing to quit. And because of a miracle, today Gavin is alive and his cancer is in remission and he's a freshman in high school. And he's an active member of a Navy Explorer unit and has gone through a boot camp in 2003 in Virginia. And he played football on his freshman high school football team this year. During Gavin's fight for life, however, there were people actively involved in supporting him. And one of those people that you're going to learn about in this case is Jamie Masada. Now, Jamie Masada you probably have not heard of, 
but you may have heard of the company that he founded. He started with the Laugh Factory on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. He now has places in Hawaii and he has a place in New York City. It's for comedians. And as one of the things that Mr. Masada did, is he sponsored camps during the summer for underprivileged children. And during the summer one year when the children were younger, the three children, Davilin, Star and Gavin, participated at the Laugh Factory in a summer program for underprivileged children. Jamie Masada took a liking to the children. He particularly took a liking to Gavin. And when he heard that Gavin was, had cancer, that it was serious and that he may not live, he began to visit Gavin on a regular basis. And some of, you know, unfortunately one of the things that happens to kids that are going to die from cancer, there are organizations and people and individuals, allow them to try to make a last wish, to make a wish. And Gavin's wish, Gavin's wish was to meet some comedians and entertainers. And Gavin's wish was to meet Chris Tucker. And Gavin's wish was to meet Adam Sandler. And Gavin's wish was to meet the defendant in this case, Michael Jackson. He actually met all of them. The first call came from the defendant while Gavin Arvizo was in the hospital recuperating from one of his chemotherapy sessions. Over the next several weeks, they exchanged television calls on a regular basis. The calls often lasted hours. And during one of the recuperative periods when Gavin was at home, Michael Jackson invited the Arvizo family from East Los Angeles to the ranch of Neverland here in Santa Barbara County. In August of 2000, the Arvizo family, Gavin's, Gavin, 10, and Star, 9, were picked up in a limousine with their mother and their father and their brother, and traveled to Neverland Valley Ranch. It was here, and you can imagine just about the excitement that must have been with the family, coming from an environment like that to the ranch and this beauty that we have here in Santa Barbara County. And the family was put up in the guest cottages at the ranch and they were there for several days. Now, on the night before the last day that they were to leave, Michael Jackson, the defendant in this case, takes Gavin aside, and he says to Gavin, Gavin, why don't you ask your parents if you can spend the night in my bedroom, at the dinner table tonight? Well, obviously here's a little kid who's in the midst of a life-threatening disease. Objection. A chance to spend the night. Objection. Overruled. Go ahead. The chance to spend the night with one of his idols. Gavin obliges. Gavin asks his parents at dinner, can I spend the night with Michael Jackson in his bedroom? And the parents say, yes, they agree. And it's agreed that Star will go along with them. Now, what happens that night is this. The defendant, Frank Tyson, the defendant's children, particularly his son Prince, Prince Michael, and the two Arvizo boys are in the downstairs area of the Jackson bedroom suite. And after a few hours, they go upstairs to the bedroom. And when they get up into the bedroom, Tyson pulls out a laptop computer, and Jackson and Tyson are hooking the computer up to the internet. And when they get on the internet, they then place the computer with the boys there, and they take the boys, 9-year-old and 10-year-old, on a tour of sexually explicit websites. Naked ladies. They take them on a tour of a number of websites. And it lasts approximately 30 to 40 minutes. And during the time that they travel through these websites, at one of the points in time when a female is shown to, with her shirt up, Exposing her breasts, the defendant turns and exclaims, Got milk. And he turns around to the sleeping prince on the bed and says, Prince, you're missing a lot of pussy. The Arvizo boys spent the night with Michael Jackson. They did not sleep in bed with him. They slept in the bed. And it is true, Jackson slept on the floor. The Arvizo boys returned to the ranch a couple of times during 2000. Never with their mother or their sister again. Jackson was rarely there. And after several months, the relationship drifted apart. The number that Gavin had been given for the defendant was no longer good. There was no more phone calls and there was relatively no contact between the Arvizos and Michael Jackson. However, the participation of Gavin Arvizo in the Martin Bashir video changed his life forever. Because, you see, Gavin Arvizo ended up being one of those boys who shared a bed with the defendant, Michael Jackson. He didn't do it in 2000 on the first visit to the ranch. And he didn't do it, as many people suspected, when they saw the Martin Bashir video. But he did it in February and in March of 2003 at Neverland Valley Ranch. I want to take you now back to some of the statements that we heard in the Bashir tape made by the defendant in this case. I want to take you back to the admissions that are found in that video about his public statements acknowledging sharing his bedroom and his bed with young boys, and to the circumstances of the explanation under, in which he says he does so. 
Let's explore that for a moment. You see, the private world of Michael Jackson is quite different from what he said on that video. As the testimony and the evidence unfolds in this particular case, you will learn that the stories he refers to in that video remark do not consist of children's books, but the internet visits to sexually explicit sites, the exposure of children to suitcases, briefcases laden with sexually explicit magazines and centerfold cutouts from magazines such as Hustler and Playboy, with titles like, Barely Legal Hardcore, Barely Legal, and many others with far more offensive covers and cover titles. You see, the private world of Michael Jackson reveals that instead of cookies and instead of milk, you can substitute wine, vodka, and bourbon. Now, publicly Michael Jackson says he doesn't drink. But his private behavior and conduct is quite the opposite, as you will learn through numerous witnesses in this case. First he's caught on film talking to Martin Bashir about wine. And he uses it and describes it as, Jesus juice the same exact expression that the Arvizo children told detectives in this case that Michael Jackson used in referring to red wine that he provided to them, and he referred to it as, Jesus juice. Former employees and security guards and maids of the defendant will tell you that he furnished alcohol, that he encouraged children to drink, and on occasion he was actually viewed to pour drinks for children. Several airline stewardesses will testify in this case. They work for a charter jet organization. They are the stewardesses on chartered planes chartered by the defendant in this case. And they have, in conjunction with the work that they do, a profile of information as to what to take on the plane to satisfy the people that are going to be on the plane. They will tell you that they have not only seen, they have not only seen the defendant drink alcohol on the planes, they have furnished it. And they have furnished it in a method and a manner exactly like the Arvizo children told detectives in this case that the defendant does and that is, that it is put in Diet Coke or soda pop cans. Indeed, several employees, including his longtime security guard Chris Carter, and others, will tell you that they observed children on the ranch drinking, in highly intoxicated states on a number of occasions when Jackson is on the ranch. Security guard Chris Carter will tell you that he observed one incident one night where he encountered Gavin Arvizo. It was late. It was dark. Gavin was intoxicated and he wanted to get into one of the little carts, electric carts that you can use to drive around the premises. Carter stopped him. He saw that Gavin was in no condition to drive. And he told him that he couldn't do that. When Carter asked the boy why he was drinking, he replied, Michael Jackson told him that he had to be a man and drink. In another incident, Michael Jackson's personal attendant and a longtime employee, Jesus Solace, will describe taking a full bottle of wine and a full bottle of vodka on a tray into Michael Jackson's bedroom with four glasses. And when he got into the bedroom, he saw the defendant and three children sitting on the bed. And when he came back the next morning to clean out the bedroom, both bottles were empty, and the glasses had been used. Another ranch employee, Kiki Fournier, is going to testify in this case. And she will tell you that on a number of occasions she saw three local Santa Inez boys intoxicated saw them at a time when Jackson was on the ranch and Jackson was with the boys. And she viewed this on a number of occasions. The private world of Michael Jackson reveals that instead of bedtime discussions and children's books and discussions of Peter Pan, at the same time that this 44-year-old man is sharing with 13-year-old Gavin and 12-year-old Star and another 11-year-old boy his collection of sexually explicit magazines, that he's talking to Gavin about masturbation and he's telling him that it is normal, and that it is okay, and that everybody does it. That each of these acts are calculated to desensitize the boy, to change his moral antenna, and to add the trust and the admiration of an adult voice to the boy's conduct to convince him that what was being done was all right in the adult world. And it worked. Lastly, you're going to be able to peek into the defendant's private world, and you're going to hear Gavin Arvizo describe to you his molestation. You will hear Star Arvizo tell you how, on other occasions, he happened upon seeing Michael Jackson masturbating himself with one hand while Jackson's other hand was inserted into the underpants of his brother, Gavin. Your Honor, I think this will probably be a good place to take the morning recess. Alright, we'll take a 15-minute recess.